Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namotasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Namotasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, the fully enlightened one. We pay homage to you and to your Dhamma. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Very nice. Okay. So happy to see everybody. Yeah, I guess the word got around. If I don't announce uh, what I'm going to do, it's probably interesting. So more people are coming. <laughs> this is kind of funny. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Um, yeah. So uh, what I'm doing this morning is I've been testing this out on someone here <laughs> and, and seeing what would happen if I did this. And so we have a thing in our booklets for our retreats. It's kind of dark, isn't it? Can I can I have some more lights that shine up here? Can you turn some more lights on? For some reason, it's really not picking up the light. Okay. There. Oh, that's probably it. Okay, that'll be better. <clears throat> okay. So we have a thing, a list of things that we use to give you in retreat. And these were a series of sayings that Bonte and I have collected when I was driving him across the country. We would pick out sayings and we found some other people had these sayings. You may have seen them before or not. So what I'm going to do is actually you're going to help me today with this class because I'm going to give you one of these sayings and you're somebody needs to raise their hand and they just, you know, let me see people. Can you let me see everybody today? I want to see you. <laughs> you know, at the university, I'll tell you a secret. If you're coming to the university classes, um, they won't let you stay if you put a placeholder anymore. <laughs> the students so they have we have to be able to see you in order to teach so I need people to turn on their visuals and let me see where you are so I'm going to give you I'm going to give you a saying and what I want you to do is just it's sort of like a quiz game and you raise your hand and take a turn saying how how would you explain this in Buddhism in Buddhist as far as Buddhists, what you've learned so far, the Dhamma, how, how would you explain this? So I might say to you, <clears throat> what you think and ponder on, that becomes the inclination of your mind. So now that's a saying. So how would you explain that to somebody? How does it affect you with your, your Dhamma? So you have to raise your hands. And jump in and say, nobody, huh? Come on. What do you think it means? What you think, what you think, and you start thinking about, first you have Vitaka, then you have Vichara, and you're thinking about something. That becomes the inclination of your mind. Have you, yeah, May? I'll get the ball. I'll start the kickstart the ball to get it. Sorry, I've got all my sentences wrong today, but you know what? Um, <laughs> start the ball. Okay. <laughs> okay, I'll get it rolling so everyone can come in. So, um, for example, uh, if someone said something to me, um, and if I uh, think that um, uh, that person uh, is judging me or um, is not happy with me or whatever it is, that thought um, keeps rolling uh, continuously on. And then soon enough, I start to get angry at that person, uh, whatever he or she may have uh, said or done or whatever. That's right. Okay, so anybody else have any ideas what this reflects to? What she's talking about, what does it sound like? Can I say my opinion? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, I think it refers to habitual tendency when you uh, think about something and you give attention to it, so it becomes bigger and bigger and uh, it repeats itself without, you know, us being aware. 
That's right. It repeats itself. So it's a bit, it's part of the habits and the habits get picked up. And what starts with an inclination of the mind, it pushes into action and drives forward the action. So this is where the beginning of karma is, where the action starts. Here's another one. Um, this is kind of an open deal. Uh, most of you can identify with this one, but in life, pain is inevitable. That means mental pain and physical pain are inevitable if you're living life. But suffering is optional. What does that mean to you? Suffering is optional. Hi, sister. For me, that's a little bit like um, suffering and pain aren't necessarily the same thing in that um, physical, I can have, there can be a physical pain, but if it's if it's not that I am identifying with it, that that's me, that that's what I am, then it's there just an experience that is there. Yes, that's, how I it. that's very good. So he's he's touching on Atta and Anatta. So the Atta is if he believes that the suffering, the pain, the mental pain, or the physical pain is me, it is mine, it is myself he's going to suffer more because he's turning it in on himself. But if he realizes that suffering is optional, if he sees how all of this works, he can choose a different perspective. And the perspective is how we choose to see life immediately. And this has been the last week, I got a chance to watch a lot of different people, how they were taking in pain and how they were handling pain and the different ways that people were sitting around handling that in a group and seeing how if you take it very personally, it gets worse and worse and worse. And this is what the Buddha is teaching us. So we are actually pretty powerful. Once again, we're not, we're not weak, but we are powerful in that we're in charge of what we choose to see first when we're living our life. Okay. Here's another one. Mind is the forerunner of all states. When we say states, these states we're talking about the forerunner of all states of getting into states, different states in meditation, but also we're talking about forerunner of all your moods, your moods for the day. Okay. You can think of it that way. Mind is the forerunner of all states. Mind is chief. Mind made are they. So what is it telling you? Everything starts. Where does everything start? In the mind. Right. Everything will start in the mind and go from there. So one thing that was always tickling me about Buddhism has this habit of saying body, speech, and mind. And yet the Christians were always saying um, thought, word, and deed. But then I found some suttas last week. I found some that were actually saying thought, word, and deed, and thinking, oh, well, it's here too. But most of the time in Buddhism, it's talking about body, speech, and mind. I think because we realize things first. When, when a feeling comes up, how do you, where do you feel it first? This is an interesting question. Where do you feel a feeling first in your body? Think about it. Where do you think you feel it? I feel it in my gut. Where in your gut, okay? Okay, in, 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 a, in a situation of fear, you know, fight or flight, something like that, you do, you have an overwhelming feeling. But if we look really deeply, even in fight or flight, okay, we'll find out that something grabs you in the heart 
first and goes into the gut and goes into your mind. It shoots in two directions, to your mind and to your gut. And what am I going to do? You know, what should I do like that? Okay. But um, a lot of people will agree that the heart picks up this and the heart is, you know, the heart is talked about in Buddhism in certain ways, but it usually will point to mind first. It'll point to mind. It starts in mind. And I think it's because mind triggers karma. Mind is what's triggering the action. Okay. So remember a comma, we'll go over comma in a minute. Okay. So now the next one is what you do in the present time dictates what happens in the future. Now, think about this in terms of your life when you get up in the morning before you go to work. How does the day go? In how does the day go before you go home in the evening? How does the evening go? You know, you can look at it that way. But tell me, is this a true statement? What you do in the present time, it dictates what happens in the future. And how, how, how do we talk about uh, past, uh, present, and future in, in Buddhism? I'm sort of tickling for answers. <laughs> what do you think about that? Hoda, what do you think? Hmm? Actually, I'm very new to this journey and I'm, I'm, I'm just enjoying and the, uh, this is my second week uh, try this uh, meta. I okay. attended in, uh, in a group meditation uh, uh, last week mm -hmm. with uh, Seal. So okay, I'm, a, yeah. I'm a very beginner. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. and, uh, and that's uh, great because, uh, for example, the last, uh, uh, last uh, things you mentioned about suffering and pain, that, mm -hmm. that was great to hear about. Mm. I'm, still, I'm still sinking the word into my mind. So yeah that's a good one to hang on to and hang on the wall and remind ourselves that in life pain is inevitable for the human being for any animal it's inevitable but suffering is optional in the human being for the reason that we have this capability of reasoning things out and processing we have options of how we're going to do it it's not quite the same as the rabbit <laughs> you know it's not quite the same as the horse you know, we're a little bit different, although they do pretty good. Horses do pretty good <laughs> deciding what they're going to do. So what do you think about what you do in the present time? Oh, no, where were we? Um, yeah. Yeah. What we do in the present time dictates what happens in the future. OK, so so what you do in the morning will dictate what happens in the afternoon. And, and you know, parents are dealing with this a lot, aren't they? how you uh, treat the children, how you correct the children, okay? Um, how you correct the children uh, depends on how they're set up for the whole morning. A lot of times when we correct children, we take away their power. And this is a very sad thing when we have the adult child attitude like this way, here's the adult, here's the child, you will do this sort of thing, okay? but. We know a lot in the last 20 or 30 years, we've come a long way in, in offering different alternatives for not taking the power away from the child and having them look at what is happening and decide, see if we can help them decide logically what makes the most sense in how to, how to behave after something happens. So we try to deal with it a little bit differently. That's a different class. <laughs> okay, but, but um, what you do in the present time situation dictates what's going to happen in the future. If you have a, uh, a social um, interaction at work with your boss in the morning, it's going to depend on the rest of the day how things go. And it depends on how close the office group is, how much this affects the whole room. And so one person in an office can affect 
15 or 20 other people. And I was working with a woman in Canada. I'm sorry, she was upstate New York in a big construction company where she was a uh, office manager in amongst 15 women. And that's enough to drive me crazy, 15 of us in one spot, you know, but anyway, 15 people in one spot is difficult, but they're all working in this, in this construction company in all the management of it, okay? And um, people were working with a down attitude of looking down and not looking at each other and sort of were frightened of the leader of the pack until she took a course with us and started looking at the impact of what I do in the present moment will dictate what happens in the future of this whole day in this office. So how I decide to take something very personally, if it happens and it's going to disturb the workload for this office, if I take it and I react to it one way, everything will go on. But if I act another way, it might not go on very well at all. And people might be very uncomfortable and frightened absolutely frightened. When she came back, she realized that she started changing about a month after carrying her practice on. She, she was realizing something's happening. And her husband said, basically, uh, the line of profit has gone up and the books are up to date. And what exactly is happening here is that she is changing and she's putting out a different vibration and a different frequency. And we put out the frequency around us is flowing all the time and affects other people. The idea that we cannot affect another person is a total fallacy. You know, and we we were challenged when I was learning in Washington, D.C. early on, we were challenged to get on a bus in Monday mornings by Bonte and sit in the back of the bus and watch who gets on. Everybody's angry on Monday mornings in Washington, D.C. in the bus. <laughs> You know, and, and you watch these people get on and they're all angry and they're like bickering with each other and you just start tipping your head down and you start sending loving kindness into the bus and the vibrations from what we're doing, we didn't think it would work, but we did what he told us and then we watched how people just stopped and everything calm down. Now, there's one thing I encourage you to do is to go online and this is where I tell you all to look up the Bodhisattva train. Go and find the Bodhisattva train, short films dash Bodhisattva train. And watch what happens with this one person getting on a train and what he does and how it affects everybody around him. Watch how it works. And this is really a great example of what I do affects people around me. And we can change, change a crowd of people when some angry incident has happened, if we are precocious enough to just walk into that crowd and, and just be smiling and saying, what's really going on here? Let's look at what's really going on and stop with two sides here and here. But what is, what is a possible solution? And just be, it surprises people. Anybody would dare to do that. I like to do that. It's kind of fun. <laughs> I've done some crazy things. But anyway, we can affect the people around us. And we all can have an effect on the people around us. It gets more and more interesting as we go. So that's how what I'm talking about when I say the present time moment dictates what happens in the future. You, you get up in the morning as a mom and everybody has pancakes and everybody's happy. It's a great morning. You're sending them all out, five kids and the husband out to do stuff and for the, for the day. And they leave smiling. They're going to have a good adventure. It lasts for a long time. If you are complaining about who's going to do the dishes and who's going to make the beds and all this other stuff, they don't go out happy. And chances are they're going to keep bickering all day. So we affect people around us. And we need to remember that. Next one. Here's the next one. Change your mind and you change your life. Have you had any experiences with this personally? Have you tried it out? Okay. 
Have you ever changed your mind and then it changes the situation? Have you done it? Hmm? Um, then I want to say very short thing about this. Uh, after starting the meta, my relationship with my, my wife has improved a lot. And, you know, we don't argue at all and uh, always smiling. And, you know, it's been very harmonious. My life has become very harmonious when I, uh, you know, starting to practice meta and giving love and just try to stop before reacting when something makes me angry. And it has really exactly. improved. Exactly. That's the kind of thing that we hear a whole lot about this year. That's the kind of thing. When you change your mind, you have changed your frequency. When you change your frequency, that's reaching around you. That's the aura around the person, the aura that's around the person. And that move, that sends out when you're working on the meta specifically, that meta goes out 500 feet around you in diameter. This was something they did at MIT a long time ago. They figured out uh, exactly how this was, uh, was reaching, how far the measurement was reaching. What it is, how it works, who knows? I don't know. Do we need to know? That's a big one. That's where science and we sort of separate ways. I like to spend my time sharing how it works and seeing it change your life. They like to divide uh, dependent origination from 12 pieces into 27 or 30 pieces and get picky, picky, picky. <laughs> you know, but it isn't necessary. 12 pieces are enough and seven lengths of dependent origination are enough for you to understand everything that's happening to you during the day, everything when you're moving around. Um, okay, let's take the next one. Um, the more, this is one of Bonte did, the more smiling thoughts we have, the more inclined mind tends towards happiness. It leans towards happiness. And this one takes us to the, uh, it, we should have a little conversation here, really. Um, do you think that happiness is a product that you should be able to have and hold and keep? Or do you think that maybe happiness is a byproduct of the way you decide to live? What do you think about happiness? There's a lot of books out there saying the way to happiness. Here's the answer to happiness. Come and get the happiness, okay? <laughs> but then there's this assumption, if you're happy, you're going to be happy all the time. Okay, I tell you a secret. I look happy right now, but I had a miserable night. <laughs> you know, it was a lot of pain and a lot of stuff going on. I had to get up and sit twice and stuff like that. But okay, but that doesn't affect me right now this morning. And one of the things, I don't know how it works. When I teach Dhamma, I don't hurt at all when I'm teaching Dhamma. So the trick here is I need to be teaching Dhamma. So what happened yesterday? Someone called me and said, would you take over 500 students for me while I write a book? I'm there, what, are you crazy, you know? And then I, I asked the people here, I said, are you willing to help me with this? If someone gives me 500 students, are you willing to help me with this? You can only put 100 students onto a screen at a time. <laughs> and they said, one of them said, well, we can do this. We can do this. We can have five groups. And I said, so you're confident enough that you're learning enough now that you can help people. And I decided actually they are, they've been working with me for a month and there's four of them. They're all into the fourth jhana and very balanced. They're all people who have been working with clients and coaching people, but a funny thing happened has happened here. They don't want to do life coaching as much as they want to be teaching TWIM. <laughs> so now maybe they will help me with this. 
and we'll do this for him because he's a monk that has uh, basically put a lot of fun into Buddhism. And I believe that the monks are the happy ones and happy people don't walk around looking like this. If everybody looked like this, would you send your kids to the temple to learn Buddhism if we all looked like this? <laughs> No, you wouldn't, you wouldn't. Now I'll tell you a story in North Carolina, a friend of mine, uh, she was at the temple for a retreat and asked her daughter to come to the Thai temple uh, where we were doing the retreat and said, please come over with me on Saturday, just for Saturday. So she and her brother went over there with the mother and then something happens. One of the monks wanted to teach the Four Noble Truths and they taught it the new way. And I, I, you know, Jackie, she knew that this was wrong, but she couldn't do anything about it. And her daughter sat there and listened to the monk say, the first noble truth is all life is suffering. That really set this 13 year old on fire. Oh boy, I wanna be a Buddhist. <laughs> then the second noble truth, he said, the cause of suffering is desire. And he didn't say anything else. Now see, it would have been okay if he said something else, but he didn't say anything else after that. The cause is definitely desire. Then, the third noble truth, he said, to have the cessation of suffering, you must desire absolutely nothing. Well, that did it. The 13-year-old leaned over to her mother in her ear and she said, okay, mom, I came here because you asked me to this Saturday. I don't ever want to come to this temple again. I will never set foot here again. I'm going to the mall to get my shoes. <laughs> That's it. She's going to go to the mall and buy her shoes. And she would never go back ever. Now, see, we don't know how that got started, but that's not the translation. And if that was the translation, I want you to logically take it and write it down and, and suppose it was the translation, just suppose for a minute, do you think the Bodhisattva would have spent six and a half years on a search to find the answer to suffering if that had been the Four Noble Truths? Absolutely not. There wouldn't have been a Buddha. Nothing would have happened. Nobody would have showed up. Who wants to hear it? You see, that's the whole thing. You cannot change the Four Noble Truths. It's one of the hot spots with me. The translation was correct with an open-ended sentence. There is suffering in life. Of course there is. But all life isn't suffering. You and I know this. You and I know that we have times when we're really happy and times when we're really sad. And the only time we're in confusion is we have not met that one cousin that we need to know about. His name is Anicca. Anicca, here I am, Anicca. Anicca is everything is changing all the time. Yep, that's me. Yep, that's me. I should put a little face on my finger. <laughs> You know, Anicca is with us all the time. Everything, what goes up goes down. What goes in goes out. You know, hot, cold, opposites are completely there. And Anicca, without Anicca, we don't even have life. If it was just there and it was stuck and it never changed, think about it. So coming back to happiness, happiness is a victim of Anicca. You and I are a victim of an each. Everybody's a victim of an, a, a, you know, it, it applies to us, everybody, everywhere, everything, every event, every experience, every relationship, everything. So the moment we believe we've got something permanent, we're in for trouble because it's going to change. It's going to evolve. It's going to grow. It's going to shift. 
the colors will change. Everything changes. When we are in denial of change, denying what Anicca is, yeah, you can't deny me. I know, I know, be quiet. <laughs> but you can't, I know I won't. <laughs> I'm here, I know you're here. <laughs> okay, that's enough. Go back in the buttonhole, okay. Anicca is applicable to everything. Everything is impermanent. And it, but it's suffering only if you don't understand that everything is changing. You see, this is what we're saying here. So the more smiling thoughts we can put into things, we set the page for what's happening for the rest of the day. The more inclined the mind tends towards happiness, the more smiling we are when we take our precepts and when we mess up on a precept. So you mess up on a precept. I'm not going to send you to hell. Okay. I'm just going to tell you, stop for a minute and take your precepts again. They're your precepts. You don't need to come to me or a monk or anybody else to take a precept. They're your precepts. precepts. You take them yourself, wherever you are. It's very nice to take them with the monk and the nun. It's very good to take them as a group, as a community. You're feeding the happiness, the balance and everything, the loving kindness and the forgiveness and the compassion into the community. And you're all helping each other. And your happiness is based on how you are living. That is the byproduct of living correctly. That's what keeps away the, uh, the living properly is keeping away the hindrances. It's, it, the hindrances are like coming down on you and the precepts are here guarding like an umbrella guarding. I should have my purple umbrella with me. <laughs> you know, you, you need to protect yourself from the hindrances coming down. That's it, you see? And you need to play with all of this. Don't get so serious with it. Life doesn't have to be so serious. The seriousness is of it is us with our auto taking everything personally. It's me. It's my fault. Look at the woman. Look at the woman in, uh, you know, uh, who learned about dependent origination. I told you the story and she had a very bad depression and she's on depressive medication and her husband's ready to leave and take the, the child and leave. And she is buried, buried in her, her, uh, her depression. Now look at her depression. You have an, a, a depression. This is your depression. She's heard all of this, right? So that translates, it's my fault. I am to blame. This is what happens with depression. The second layer is it's my fault. I am to blame. Are you? Are you? Really? Really? No, because you were not taught how things work. You were not taught how the everything in life actually operates. And so how can it be your fault? Depression is something that you most cases now it's not all cases. We're not including the ones that are heavily chemically imbalanced that we can see those in a CAT scan are different. But in general, three quarters of the depressive disorders on this earth are caused by people not understanding nothing is happening to you. Everything is happening from you. That's the big one. Nothing happens to you. Everything happens from you. Means what? Means you're on the boat. It's your boat going through life. Here you go. You're on the boat and you're steering. Nobody else is steering. This is what we have to get rid of. You're not a victim of anything. It's time for you to learn how to steer the ship. In order to steer the ship, you need to understand the engine and understand what to do if it gets stuck. You can't do that if they don't teach you in health class in high school. It really gets me upset that they don't teach you basic human cognition in high school. If they taught you that, you would be in much better shape 
but a depressive disorder doesn't start as a depressive disorder, does it? It starts as tension and then it turns into stress. And the first diagnosis the doctor will talk to you about is stress disorder. And the next one will be a, a depressive disorder at some level between zero, well, between one and 10, between one and 10, okay? And most of these, one to six, one to five or six, these are things that are controllable. Now, taking a drug for depression, why? Because if it hits you, you are unreasonable, you cannot learn, you cannot hear, and you cannot compute things in your mind. Taking a drug for stability of a depression so that you can learn how things work and take things and understand how it works, <laughs> that's important. But be careful because you have to be able to talk to your psychologist or your psychiatrist. You have to be not working with a dictator. This is important. You try to work with somebody in a group of, of psychologists or psychiatrists who are willing to work with you, not on top of you or not ordering you all the time. You see, you have to choose for quality of life. When you decide to take, try something and go along with trying something, okay, try it, but be very careful that you try it to be stabilized so that you can hear what I'm saying or hear what somebody else is willing to explain to you. How does all this work? You're sitting on a couch. She was sitting on a couch. She was knitting, just knitting, crocheting, and her brain, her mind meets a mind object, a thought. And mind consciousness comes up and that makes mind contact happen. With mind contact as condition, what happens next? What happens is she has a painful feeling. And with this painful feeling as condition, what happens next? That painful feeling jumps into, I don't like this. I don't want this. This is hurting me. And so she says, this is the depression, it's here. She folds up her knitting. This is her reaction. She goes into habitual tendencies. What does she do when she starts thinking about this and clinging, this, this clinging of this is, the, this is the depression, it's coming to get me. I have to get out of the room. I don't wanna hurt my husband. I don't wanna hurt my son. She folds up her knitting, she puts it in a basket, she goes in her room, she shuts the door, she turns out the light, she climbs the bed and she cries herself to sleep. You can understand why they wanna, they, he's ready to leave. Nobody's willing to explain what's happening here. Once I sit down with her, I sat down with her and I showed her what would happen if I could show you that this depression is not your depression? It's not yours. It's part of the human condition of human cognition. You were sitting on the couch. You heard something or thought something in your mind, you thought it, or you heard something that reminded you of this depression and you fell into contact, feeling, craving, clinging, and started thinking with mental proliferation about what this is so sad, this is here, this is happening to me. You see, she takes it this way. Why does she take it that way? Because everybody's taking it that way. You grew up seeing your mother take it that way. You grew up seeing your father take it that way. Everybody who was fighting with anybody is taking it that way. You see, everybody's coming at everybody. Yeah, everybody's coming at everybody. It's assumed everybody's coming at everybody. But what if everybody's not coming at everybody? What if we forced Here's a picture for you. We have a peace conference and we capture all of them before they go in the building from all the different countries. We tie them to a chair. We put a piece of tape over their mouth and we teach them dependent origination. <laughs> and then we let them go into the peace conference and we tell them, you cannot take anything personally at this conference. It's a peace conference. We wanna hear all of the options for peace. And so what you do is you say, all right, here's the deal. When you go in there, just remember, you're not allowed to take anything personally and nobody's allowed to say, well, we can't do that because they always do this. 
That's what happens. I kid about it all the time. I send Alexander in with an idea at the peace conference. I could send you into the peace conference and you have the perfect idea to solve world peace, the perfect idea. And they won't let you present it because the first time you say that Israel could talk to Syria and Russia could embrace the Ukraine and the Chinese would help everybody, then everybody starts screaming. But they always do this and they always do that. We are so caught in the past that we must repeat it again. Where is the future? You see my problem here? So what if when they went in, they weren't allowed to say, but you always do this and we can't consider what Alexander says because it involves them and they'll do it again, you see? Wouldn't things change a little bit if we say, but what if we understood it's vital for everybody to attempt to look at the issue of what's happening impersonally and consider what, what, what is possible? Is this all that's possible? There was a 12-year-old girl or a nine-year-old girl, I can't remember, who was allowed to talk to the UN about two years ago. And she went in there and pleaded with them and they listened to her. She's like, we're all like 11, 12 years old. We'd like to know if you're going to consider anything different in the future. She pleaded with them and reasoned it all out the way I'm sort of talking to you about it. And she was only 12 or 13 you know, 12 or 11 years old, and they let her talk. And they all had their heads down. They're all looking at their desk and they all know they have been naughty children, <laughs> all of them. And they have to decide at some point that this, you know, has to stop. So, there are hopeful things in the future. When I explain to you here, you are powerful. You are not weak. You are powerful. You are strong. But the issue for you is not understanding that you are driving your own boat in life. Nobody's going to come get on the boat. You determine. And when it starts going this way and you know it shouldn't, you turn it to go that way. And you keep training the brain. How do we change? We change by purifying and retraining our minds. This is what we do. We change by purifying and then retraining our mind. How do we retrain the mind? Do we know Yes, we do. We know you have to go like this to the mind again and again, the same exact way. What does it have to do with? It has to do with stop and just listen with compassion to what the other person is saying, even if you don't want to hear any of it and you don't believe any of it and you disagree with all of it, you just listen until they're done. And then you go get some ice cream or you go get tea or you go get coffee and you find out. But what's really wrong here is that human beings believe they're stuck and we are not stuck. I don't accept it. We are not stuck. We have the potential for change. The only way any obstacle becomes an obstruction is if you engage in that obstacle. You see, it carry it through, carry it through what I just said about the peace meetings, about politics, about your life, about everything. The only way an obstacle can become an obstruction, the Buddha tells us, is if you engage it. Because when you engage that obstacle and give it attention, you're making it stronger. You're feeding it nutriment. You're asking for more. So when you're finished, what you do is you basically, you wash your face. You take cold water and put it on your head. You get real comfortable. And then you start to look at the truth. Patience is the only way out of this. And the only way out of this for us is to go in. 
in here, in. The only way out is in. I'm going to have a t-shirt made like that. I think a big pink one, you know. The only way out is in. That's the only way. And someone must stop me to ask me what it means. <laughs> Hopefully. The only way out of this mess is to go in to find out what did he find? What in the world did this man find that he would take a whole population and, you know, get it moving in a different direction, have kings completely change their decisions, have generals back up and find other ways of settling wars, change communities, change cities, change everything at that time. What is it that he found? And really, truly what he found is that each one of us is strong and we are individuals and we have a lot of strength. We just don't know who we are. So who are we? We're only, we're only basically five things, only five things. We are basically a body that is here from our head to our toes. And remember this from our head to our toes, because in calisthenics exercise, people think this from here down is the person. <laughs> they think from the shoulders down is the person. In the 1970s, we didn't have any head exercises, you know, for this part up here. It's very strange when I look back on that. We had all kinds of exercises, but this was just something that followed the rest of me. But this from here down were our exercises in calisthenics from here down. That's not it. The Buddha insists the being is from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. That's what he told Ananda. Where is the world, Lord, Ananda said. It is between your top of your head and the soles of your feet. That's where it is. Okay. So you have this body, you have feeling, and the feeling is easy to, to work with. Don't get confused. You know, there's a thing called Abhidhamma, and you might love it. My grandmother would have adored it. She likes confusing, uh, confusing words. She can't talk to my grandmother when I was growing up until she finished the New York Times word puzzle completely in the morning on Sunday. You couldn't say a word to her. She was wrapped up in, in vocabulary and everything. Okay. Don't get complex. You have the body, the feelings are simple. Abhidhamma is about all of the possible feelings you can talk about, all of the kinds of karma you can talk about. This is kind of like me saying that Benham wants to be an engineer, but he wants to go to um, 401 for the class first instead of 101 at the university. He wants to skip 101, 102, 103. We'll just go to four, you know, to go to 401 for the fourth year and get my degree and be an engineer. You can't do that. You can't do that. And this is no different. This is no different, okay? This is very logical. What happens here is uh, that you have this body, then you have three kinds of feelings, all you need to know about pleasant, painful, or neutral. Just think of that way. Pleasant and painful is enough to get you to Nibbana. Pleasant, Painful or neutral, okay? The next one, body, feeling, perception. Perception, what is perception? Well, perception perceives. And to perceive something is to name it. Pink bottle. Yeah, Lobo thought I needed a bottle. So pink bottle. Mm -hmm. So, Body, feeling, perception perceives what I see, the form with my eye, and eye consciousness arises. The meeting of these three pieces, okay, is contact. There you go. That's contact. We contact as condition, feeling arises, seen as pleasant, painful, or neutral. Now, if it was a red rose, what is it that said red rose? Right when you have the contact happen as the feeling is coming up, perception jumps in and says red rose and comes out. 
we all are guilty of carrying dictionaries and encyclopedias in our head now. We are adults. We are not privileged to have empty heads and run around and play tag anymore. Although having said that, I like to go to the beach and challenge the kids to run around with me. <laughs> That's kind of funny, you know, um, but I end up having them run around me and me sitting still right now. <laughs> but okay, so Body, feeling, perception perceives red rose. Okay. Thoughts are the next one. The thought that comes up about the red rose. And that one is equivalent kind of to I like it or I don't like it. The feeling and then the craving. When the craving comes, that's where it happens. I like this red rose. My And then... Clinging, if you want to understand clinging in terms of the red rose, I saw it, it's pleasant, I like it. Now I start thinking, and my mother loves red roses, and what I should do is snip it and take it with me, and that's my habitual thing I would do. So I reach into my habitual tendency and grab my little scissors, and I clip it, and then I give the birth of action. I actually clip the rose, and I run away and give it to my mom. See, so there is an action with the complete line of the human cognition, exactly how it's happening. So your seven links to be most concerned with, to carry around with you, to play with wherever you go is basically the six sense doors that you start contact, feeling, craving, clinging, habitual tendencies birth of action, and then the aging of this event. Now, aging and death, they call it aging and death, okay? But actually, it's an abbreviation for aging. And as the event is happening, there can be sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. And then there is the death of the event. So we're talking about this time in this life, how we use dependent origination. We can have a class and talk about different lifetimes and how it all affects and everything if we want to talk about that, but that's not going to help my relationship with Benham and me or Benham and his wife. It's not going to help their relationship at all in this present time. It's not. Or we could get a scientific magazine and try to examine exactly how fast is the brain calculating each one of those circles that we talk about, because each one of those little circles gives birth to circles and circles and circles and circles. And it happens very, very fast. Like there's a hundred thousand of them Mataji, inside, inside the brain. You see? Mataji. Okay. You Hello, Sarma. Oh, yes, yes. You are speaking about the thought. What is the thought you mentioned? The thought should be, if you explain unwholesome, wholesome also, it would be nice. Yes, well, that's the most important thing. Ah, that's what it is. Yeah, well, the most important what is, thing. Well, what we'll, is the thought of unwholesome, cruelty and non-animity, enmity and sensual? Three types of yes, thoughts. Yes, but Sarma, Sarma, well, we're not there. Before going for the, before going for the yeah. dependent organization, <laughs> If you speak about that, that would be very Sarma, nice. Sarma, yes. you haven't been, you haven't been here for the whole class. <laughs> we were talking. Okay, the basic flow of what Sarma is talking about is the basic flow of this whole thing. Right yes, now, we're is, just talking about the human being. It's actually a heavy subject for them. If you speak the thoughts, no. unwholesome, wholesome, that would be very nice. How to control them? That will give more sense Sarma, to them. Yeah. Sarma, it's okay. Close. <laughs> okay, this is the starting place for you have to know who you are before you can even talk about that. So you're talking about the way the Buddha taught was basically teaching you Dana Sila Bhavana and then teaching you precisely who you are and who you are is the body, feeling, perception, thoughts, and consciousness. And teaching this this way, teaching them dependent origination across lifetimes and spinning and all that stuff is very difficult. But teaching them how to use only, only uh, seven links is fantastically effective and teaching people to 
to learn exactly how things work very quickly in this lifetime. And if you want to go to the commentary and go to the back of the book where there's a drawing for, uh, you know, for the, um, you know, Vasudhimaga, you can even find those seven links, which I was interested in his chart. He shows those seven links encompass this lifetime. And these are not secret things and they are not difficult to understand if you play with them and you use them all the time. So we have people going down to the, to the beach and uh, playing with kids and they learn them very fast. The kids learn them and then you go back next week and they're playing differently when they agree to practice this, they are playing differently. And this is, this is stuff I'm experimenting with and having fun, you know, working with people to see how fast the average person can get this. Now, the person who's read a lot, studied a lot, been around a lot of monks and a lot of big teachers who say, oh, this is so complicated, we can't talk about it. It's so heavy, it's the weight of the oceans of the earth upon my head. This is something Buddha Gosa said. This is not something the Buddha said. Let's remember that. Okay. And it's not that hard, you see, to talk about how contact happens, how feeling arises, how craving operates, how clinging works, and how, um, you know, the birth of action happens and how you do things from the past all the time and repeat them. This is not complicated. And when people sit there and smile at me as I'm saying it and they go, yeah, yeah, that is how it works. I do think of something I don't like. And then I think of all the things and all the times that I thought that I didn't like it. I, that's exactly how it works. And as a matter of fact, usually when that happens, this is what I do. Wow, that's right. He figured that out. He did figure that out. And he figured it out for you and the average person, not for academics and monks that are locked up in temples and are not going to talk about it because they think it's too, too, too difficult. They have to get over this. Or in this day and time, in my opinion, this Buddhism is going to go, keep going down, keep going down, because it has to be applicable in your life. And the applicable part is coming when we talk about he's what Sarma's mentioning is important because the whole program, the whole entire thing is based on unwholesome mind states have tension and tightness in them. And they have personal opinion in them. Wholesome, uh, wholesome mind states have no tension, no much less tension and tightness in them and have impersonal possibilities in front of them. That's a big difference in your life, a big difference. Instead of saying, I'm locked into this and you want me to get locked in that, I said, no, don't get locked in it. I'm not asking you to do anything. I'm asking you to test the water and if it's the right temperature, by all means, dive in and swim. Woo! <laughs> you know, and get more and more of it, because this is how this works. We have to taste it. And when you come here, I'm not telling you, you have to do anything. And these teachers who are being trained here in Poland, they don't have to be telling anybody to do anything. And they're here from Sweden now, and from, uh, from Sweden and the UK, and Czech Republic and different places that want to know how can we actually put this into action. And putting into action goes beyond, we can describe a whole class on wholesome and unwholesome if you want to, we can do that. We, all we have to do is go to the, the, uh, go to the sutta number 19, for those of you that don't realize this, the very first page in 19 is where we always start our retreats. And Sarma can remember this. I know he can. You know, we start the retreat with the Dwayda Vitaka Sutta. Monks, before my enlightenment, while I was still only an unenlightened bodhisattva, it occurred to me, suppose I divide my thoughts into two classes. This is the very beginning of his idea about what he's teaching he's going to teach. This is his very first idea. He's a bodhisattva here, he's not a Buddha. It occurred to me that if I divide them into two classes, I could set 
on one side, thoughts of sensual desire, thoughts of ill will, and thoughts of cruelty. And if I said on the other side, thoughts of renunciation, thoughts of non-ill will, and thoughts of non-cruelty, and non-ill will is loving kindness, and thoughts of non-cruelty is, um, is compassion. So when we look at what we're teaching about in other suttas, about the four steps of the Brahma Viharas that you're learning, we're teaching you Brahma Viharas as a step program. We can teach you breathing meditation to calm you down, but to have a step program to actually change you in life, if you are practicing your loving kindness, thoughts of ill will will not come up. When you're practicing the compassion, when it turns into the compassion and you're practicing that, then thoughts of cruelty stop. Then when joy comes up, any thoughts of discontent stop. Think about it. If you're happy about something that you just received, are you discontent about anything? You can take little examples like that and say, you know, that that's right. If I'm full of joy about something, I'm not discontent, you see? And the last one is upeka, the equanimity. And when you get to upeka, there's no aversion to anything, nothing. And when we go down and we walk around the seaside and we see people, we, we were playing with this last week. I took them down. This is an old 1960s version of playing with people. I took them down to the seaside to the restaurant area where there was a bickering going on in one of the restaurants and a man was very upset with the owner and he was having a big, uh, you know, a big um, display of uh, disrespect for this owner and saying he didn't get enough food and complaining about everything. And we just sat there at the table and we started sending loving kindness as hard as we could. We're looking down at the table and we're just smiling as hard as we could and we're sending it all around us. And within two minutes, phew, all the yelling stopped right away. Stop. I challenge you to play with this and you decide if it works. I've done it on buses. I've done it on trains. I've done it in the midst of when everybody's going crazy in a situation and you just start using it and you can go and walk through those people and everybody is calming down and some of them are looking around like what just happened well something happens i think we need the nasa to come in and measure what happened <laughs> nobody can explain what happens but they calm down and what happened to this the buddha was he says i abided diligent ardent and and resolute, a thought of sensual desire arose in me, and I understood that this is a sensual desire that has arisen in me, and it and it's leading to my to to my affliction. How it leads to your tension and tightness in you, and it leads to others' affliction around you, and to both, and it obstructs my uh, uh, any wisdom. And we say wisdom is seeing how everything is working. It obstructs us from seeing that. And it causes difficulties in the situation. It leads away from me, uh, from Nibbana. It leads away from the peace and security that would happen if I were to reach Nibbana. When I considered this, that it leads to my affliction, uh, then it subsided in me. As soon as I understood how it worked, it subsided in me. When I considered this leads to others' afflictions, it subsided more in me. When I considered it leads to the affliction of both of us, if I stay tight and tense and defensive and aggressive, well, then it leads to the affliction of all of us. But then what he does is he, um, you know, he changes and um, he, he changes and he tries the other way. And this does not lead to a uh, affliction. And this is where he discovers that whenever a monk would frequently think and ponder on whatever they're thinking about, that will become the inclination of the mind. And the mind is where it starts as the beginning for the action and the action you take from mind and then 
the thoughts, the words, and the action flow like, like this all the time. And he keeps reminding you in all the suttas to watch the body and watch what happens in your speech and watch what happens in the mind. So this is a combination. The whole program is giving us a, a combination of the, uh, the 37 requisites of enlightenment. Learning them is giving us the support system we need to understand how this whole mechanism of the human being is working. And so in understanding that this is not, it's not Greek, it's not space age language, it's not space math. It was easy for the common man to learn enough to practice in a simple way and start having a peaceful, peaceful life. So the last one of these phrases in here, I probably already said was uh, patience is the way to Nibbana. That's the last one. Patience is the way to Nibbana. We were doing this earlier, Sarma, where we said a phrase and then you, somebody would say something in reference to the Buddhist teaching, what it means in that phrase. So in this one is patience is the way to Nibbana. And the patience, what are we talking about to experience the opening or the liberation of the mind? In order to do that, we have to personally get out of the way. This is what is important. And when I say we have to get out of the way, uh, somebody said, well, isn't that mean to say to a student, just get out of the way? Well, <laughs> the problem is you think you're coming to make this happen, to personally make this whole process happen and the opening happen. And that's what you're used to doing in life is making something happen and saying, I did this. But this is a different kind of experience. This is an experience where you are actually going to step out of the way and see what happens if we simply allow the development to happen. And we notice when something comes in from the unwholesome or something pushes in from the wholesome and we stay neutral. And when, and when we stay in a neutral position, we can go to the deepest levels. And this is how we can go down the path. This is why this practice leads over to the path. And then we talk about the paths when we talk about the Anurada, Anupada Sutta. We describe what happened to Sariputta in his particular kind of sitting. That's what twim is. It's an awareness, it's jhana, but it's an awareness jhana where the samatha, the serenity of the practice, okay, and the, um, some, and the insight, they're happening together, but not like this. Someone said, that's not possible. You can't put a, uh, the two horses on top of each other. I said, who said I was putting the two horses on top of each other and telling them to pull the wagon? I wasn't saying that. I said they were yoked evenly together. Go in 149, section 10, and see that. <clears throat> the serenity and insight have to be yoked evenly together. But what happens is when the serenity is at the proper level, the insight goes, oh, that's anatta. Wow. Boom. And then you're practicing again. <laughs> and you're practicing a little bit. Oh, wow. Now I get a Nietzsche. I understand it like that. And then when you see the dukkha and you see how it's happening, all of a sudden it gets in balance and you have some experiences during the day outside of your sitting. This is a practice you're supposed to be doing all the time. It's not a practice you're supposed to be doing only in retreat. This is one you take and you put it in your pockets. You carry it with you all the time. In every situation of living, this is there with you. It's supposed to be exercised, and the more that it is used, the is directly proportional. How fast does it happen? It's directly proportional to how well you keep using the practice. Why? Because that's how you retrain the brain. That's how you keep retraining the brain. You see? Okay. So we went through these verses. We did pretty well with some of them. Then we went on a ride. I knew we would end up going on a ride, jump on a horse and go. <laughs> so we jumped on a horse a couple of times. So 
So you see how these phrases, the, the different things that we said, you know, th this morning, you see how they can apply in your life. And you remember, each week you remember, you are not alone. You are full. There are thousands of people doing this now. I would just not even believe what happened with last night with being given 500 students to take care of. I would never have believed that would happen. And here we are trying to figure out now, what do we do with them? <laughs> no, we know what to do with them, but I have help in all of that. How did that all happen? How did it all fall in place that I ended up here with four people who were going to do one thing and learn TWIM and now took the one thing and put it over here and decided this is worth a lot more. This helps people a lot faster. This is changing people's lives. And they all, they want, are ready to really do this. And then the end of this week, they said, we don't wanna be paid anymore. We don't wanna be paid anymore. So what are we moving towards? Don't tell them, okay. <laughs> They're probably moving towards ending up as monks, but don't tell them, okay? <laughs> I tease them about it, but they probably are because that's where they've come, you know, asking these questions, these questions and questions about people being able to reason with each other, people being able to work out problems together, people being able to have think tanks the way the think tank people operate. Nobody gets mad at anybody when they say what they think about anything. There's no getting mad at anybody or saying, you're right, I'm wrong. There's only the operation of the human being. And there's only how does us all work. And when you try it, it's that silly commercial about the hamburger lady, this little old lady, she says, I tried it, I like it. <laughs> and then she says to you, here, try it, you'll like it. <laughs> you know, that's all I can say to you. I can point, but I'm not gonna say anything beyond that, except you have to experience for yourself what it's done for people and see what it does for you, okay? So let's take about five minutes here, okay? Uh, or 10 minutes and have a comment time. Okay, anybody? Questions? Uh, can I ask a question? Okay, uh, Benham, yeah, I'll come over so a minute. Benham? Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question about practicing the Samatha and Vipassana together. Uh, mm -hmm. When we practice Samatha, we put our attention on uh, the Metta, right? So no. when some well. Yeah, right. When something mm -hmm. arises, we need to uh, move our attention toward that thing, you know, to see the honor. No, 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 no. So how we do this together? You, you have to go back and you have to read your instructions a number of times. I think I have your, um, I have your email and I can, I send you the link to listen very carefully how we do this. The object of meditation is different than watching something come up and down with the breath. This is not indicated anywhere in the text, that kind of concentration. And that comes from other things that were developed before that came in and took over. We don't know when, but within 100 years after the Buddha was gone, it went back towards an object. We need to have this object, okay? The object of meditation, we have to understand what the object of meditation is for first. So let's look at that first. The object of meditation has one purpose. When you are pulled away from sending the loving kindness to yourself or to your friend, when a, when a thought comes up, you are to let it go let go of your attention off of whatever came up. Whatever came up is not important. And what you were doing, sending the loving kindness to yourself is your first object, sending the loving kindness to your spiritual friend for the rest of the time, that's your object. But what is the object for? You have to keep saying that to yourself. The object is an anchor. It's like there's a boat, okay? Like pretend, pretend um, I need a boat here. Here's a boat, okay? This is a boat, okay? And this boat has to have an anchor hooked to it. You can put that back in, I guess, huh? 
um, okay, put this, this boat has an anchor and the anchor is in the lake, in, in the ground, in the ocean. And the boat can't float away. It can't, it can't float away. So in the case of meta, meta is the anchor. Meta is the object of meditation. But we say it this way, send the feeling of loving kindness and sending it to your friend. That is your object of meditation. Breath has nothing to do with this practice. Let it go. If you, you know, if you were practicing breath before, there's nothing wrong with it. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that practice because it calms people down. Then when we go into this level of practice, we're putting you on a track to, on, on, a, on a, you're putting you on the train that goes to Nibbana, so to speak, okay? We're putting you in the, in the ship that is going to Nibbana and it's going to teach you how to follow, get to path, how to experience the parts of the path as you go along and what the difference of those parts are and everything as you go through and experience this and what it's like to feel the opening of the mind and the opening experience is what the Nibbana is about, okay? That's what we're talking in this, this practice, this terminology, okay? So you're not concentrating on the object, you're learning what the object was really for. And we would say this way, if something came up over here, then it pulls you away. You come back to the object of meditation, which is the feeling of loving kindness and sending it to the friend. You keep the friend in front of you. You keep the friend in your mind. You follow who that friend is supposed to be. If you're, a, if you're a guy, it's supposed to be another man. If it's a woman, it's supposed to be another woman. It's not supposed to bring up any lust at all. It has to be someone who's alive. They may not be dead. And they, when you're practicing this to learn it. Later on, if you wanna use somebody who died, it's okay. But when you're learning this, you don't wanna get into the story of grandpa and how we used to fish together and we used to go camping and there you go. Now you're not meditating. You're thinking about granddad and you're thinking about everything I did with that person. So you don't want to, um, the purpose of the object is the very important thing. We call it attitude, object attitude. Your attitude toward the object is I know what you're for. You don't have any information for me to reach Nibbana. And you're just for me in a way that you, you keep me on my, you keep me in line with my, my, you keep me going on my path with my object of meditation, which is the loving kindness, which is going to turn into compassion, which is gonna turn into joy, which is gonna turn into these other, uh, the other things. So don't mix up breathing meditation with metta meditation. These are two separate things. We have the same problem with metta and forgiveness. Don't mix metta and forgiveness together. These are three different practices. Breathing, uh, you, know, you know, the metta meditation and um, the, the, the uh, forgiveness meditation. These are three separate things, okay? I, I, you got it? I, I, don't, I don't mix them. My question is about if I put my attention on metta, so when I'm going to learn about uh, on, on it, on or anatta, because if I want to learn about anicca, so I must uh, look at what is rising up. No, know? no, 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 no. Just when, if you want to look at it, look at anicca, look at the fact that everything just changed when you left your metta and moved over there. When you practice, I, I will give you a, um, I hate to wait till next week. <laughs> well, how much time do we have? Um, mm, you need to look at the, you need to understand, I have a PowerPoint, but I can't remember how long it is, May. <laughs> you know, but in the PowerPoint presentation, it's really trying to get you to understand. You learn about Anicca, Dukkha, and Anatta absolutely, completely, the deepest way you can possibly understand it when you learn dependent origination also. Dependent, there's a, in the text, it's very clear. We learn Anicca, Dukkha, Anatta every single time that you practice the six R's. If I had my my screen up, I could draw it, but I can't do it on this. Um, what he's asking, 
No, samatha doesn't mean equanimity. That's what samatha you does, No, samatha does not mean equanimity. Samatha means serenity. That's different from equanimity. You can be calm, but then if I fire a gun, you're going to jump. Equanimity is when you, your whole body and system and mind are completely calm and somebody fires the gun and there's no reaction at all in your heart, your stomach, or your mind. That's equanimity. This is totally different than serenity, okay? So please don't mix up serenity and equanimity and don't mix up tranquility and equanimity. These are two different things. If you don't understand that, go to the Upanisha Sutta and look at where Upanisha, where, where the tranquility is happening to understand the development line of the person in, in the practice. Okay. Um, let's go through the steps of the, uh, the six R's to try to show you this without a drawing, which is always bad when I try and do this, but you are sitting in your meditation and something comes up over here and it pulls you away. This is the distraction, okay? So when this comes over here, did your practice change? It changed, didn't it? So when you were practicing, you could not have permanent position of watching metta because it went over here. And that's an example of anicca. So every time you practice the six R's, first you're, you're, you're pulled over here. Now you have to release that and relax and return over here and keep going again. You're attempting to stay on this line in front of yourself and not go off it at all under any circumstances at all. For any thought, any vision, any lights you see, any colors, any patterns, anything, nothing. This is the acceptance we have. We have to make a commitment. We're not going to move our attention away from sending this to our friends. Okay, now when the uh, the the um, the thought something pops up, or you hear something, smell something, taste something, feel something walking across you, big tarantula, you know, <laughs> you know, whatever is happening, you just let it go, relax, smile, and come back is the way that you keep on this. This is practicing right effort. When you let go of this, this was an impure thought. The distraction is an impure thought. You let go of the impurity, you are purifying the mind. You're purifying the mind here and purifying the, bra the brain here when you relax. Then when you smile and come back, those two steps are retraining the mind what you wanna do. You wanna stay here, here, okay? That's your goal, to stay right here in this avenue. In this, If I drew a road, we're going to stay right here. We're not going to look at anything in the past or look at anything in the future. And if anything pops up that pulls us away, we're going to let go, relax, smile, and come back. And you will fall very, very deeply. And you have to remember, when you let go, you relax, you smile. The smile is being undercut right now at Damasuka. When they're writing things about this, they're talking about the relaxed step is everything. Well, it isn't. I'm gonna tell you right now, it isn't. And you want the high rate of people being able to go all the way through, they have to keep smiling. Why? Because this muscle is going up into your brain, is opening your head and is relaxing your mind and tapping into the hormones that are coming, the dopamine and um, oxygens, they're called, the oxygens that are coming from the pineal gland are only able to do that when you relax slightly like that. It can't be tight together. You see that? It can't be really tight together like that. It has to relax. So what makes that relax? What makes that open? It's the smile. It's not the release, the relaxed step. The relaxed step is part of it, but not the finished product. 
You see, there's two ingredients to this. And we know this because if you let the person walk around all day frowning, they don't advance. But if I get really down on them hard and make them go around and start smiling more, they get a better job, they get a higher pay, they get along with people and people want more of them and they're doing better in life. It affects everything. And I'm a human resources person. I can tell you, if you go to the interview and you're sad sack and you're not smiling and you don't know anything about the company and you don't know what they did last year or what they're trying to do this year, and you go for an interview, you're not gonna get the job. But if you know about the company and you looked into the company and who they are and you know what the company was making and about them, what they did last year, what their goals are for this year, what you do for a living, and you know that you could help them if they hired you, you can convince them to hire you because you believe in yourself and you know the knowledge you need, you see? So this thing about moving over here Watch this, I'll show you something. I can, I can do this one, May, I think. <laughs> All right, here, something comes up over here and this is the first meditator. And this meditator, when it comes up, they look over there and they move over there. And there are people who will say to understand a Nietzsche, you have to go over there and sit with that until it goes away. Well, I've got news for you. If you sit with it, it's gonna be there a lot longer than if you let it be, let it go. Because you're feeding it attention. And I can prove it to you in the Samyutta Nikaya, in the Angutra Nikaya, and in the Majima Nikaya. If you go over there and give it your personal attention, you're gonna make it come up again and again, longer, stronger, and stay and bother you. You don't need that. If you want to understand a Nietzsche Benham, go outside to a park or go to a forest and take a walk. And when you're in the forest, you're going to see a seed and you're going to see a baby tree and you're going to see a sapling and a teenage tree and a tree in its 20s and a tree in its 50s. And you're going to see a giant tree and then you're going to see a tree that fell down and it's cracked and it's rotting and it's falling, it's going away. And everything in this whole world and universe is a Nietzsche, it's impermanent. If you can tell me one thing by next week, I want you to try to do this for me. You sit there and you think of one thing in your life here that is absolutely permanent. You try and see what it is. See what's permanent. You and come back, next, come back next week and tell me what is permanent. You, okay. I, I like won't tell you. Me. Yeah, Sarma. Oh, this is regarding, at least next time, could you please cover this? In most of the Hindu scriptures, they speak about the renunciation. That renunciation is never uh, heard from you so far. But... Buddha spoke about the renunciation uh, to make an unwholesome thought into a wholesome thought. How it will be helpful, whether it is a sensual uh, way of uh, controlling uh, is called the renunciation or the thoughts of uh, enmity and cruelty, they are deeper in sense. So will it help? in renunciation. I think thoughts of renunciation is more important. Well, you're here's something that you're renouncing. To renounce is to let go. Shh, 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 wait a second. To renounce is to let go. Every time I let go of an object, I am practicing renunciation of the arising object and I am staying with my practice. See, every single time. There's all different levels of renunciation. Where do you want to talk about it? We talk about it all the time, but we don't really give a class on renunciation. If you want a class on renunciation, we can do that. That's okay. No, 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 no. I am not asking a class. It's only thoughts when they, are, when they are transformed from unwholesome state to the wholesome state. The first yeah. thing, the first thought is 
it's called wholesome thought is called renunciation this is what i heard from one of the no no, 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 no. No, listen, listen. To renounce the unwholesome is the renunciation. To embrace the wholesome is the step you're taking. The renunciation is not the wholesome thought. The renunciation is to let go. Look up the That's word right. renunciation. From the unwholesome to wholesome, the renunciation helps, helps. How it helps and how it will be. That's what I would like to know from you. Well, that's what we're doing. We just spent a whole class on it. You, class. you came in late. <laughs> you came in late. Yeah. But the renunciation to renounce, what does it mean to renounce? Let to go renounce. Of that. Whatever the mind is grabbing, the position. Right. Rise right. To right. Pose. Practice let, renunciation. Let go, let go of that. Right. So when Benham says, if I shouldn't, I move over there and stay with that. And to, he's trying to understand Anicca. I'm telling him the Buddha came along and said, that's wrong. You don't have to do that. You need to practice renunciation and you let that go and you come back. This is what I'm telling Benham. So what I'm answering, what you're saying. The, the question here is you have to go to the word um, define, okay, define, renounce, renunciation, let's do it that way, renunciation, renunciation is to give up something, right, okay, the formal rejection of something, typically a belief or a course of action. In Buddhism, it is a course of action. You abandon something. You, the uh, abandonment of a wrong position to embrace a right position, that is renunciation. So whoever told you the renunciation is when you move over to the thought is totally wrong. It's just, it's possible they have dyslexia. If they dyslexia means you turn it around in your mind and they got mixed up and they thought the renunciation was moving over here. It's not moving over here. It's letting that go and staying here. You have renounced. You have renounced the unwholesome and embraced the wholesome. Okay. That is embracing, is taking hold of the precepts and the the understanding the 37 requisites and the eightfold path these are your support structure pieces for you learning the dhamma and all of this is a practice of renunciation bonti and i went a little further we renounced our whole entire life and turned away and went to teaching renunciation that's what the whole practice is so in the basic part you're right Renunciation is giving up the unwholesome and embracing the wholesome. That is the easy way to say to somebody, this is what this is. The problem with just saying that to someone is they don't move forward and progress. Why don't they progress? Because you'd have to explain to them what exactly are you letting go of and what exactly are you embracing? This is the simple way to say this. And embracing so you have to Embracing yeah. the smile is correct, I think. Yes, because the smile is very wholesome and opens your mind up so that you can, what the smile is doing, we cannot leave out of the recipe and don't leave it out if you don't hear it. Because when you smile, you uplift the mind by that opening happening and you sharpen the Sati, you sharpen the sati so that you can observe more quickly the arising of tension and tightness and let go and relax and smile and come back. So we're actually, we're agreeing. Let's do our closing, okay? In closing prayer, may suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. 
May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. And may they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. I will see you. Uh,